Welcome everyone. Uh, you maybe were at the colloquium yesterday, so you heard Kyle. Uh, Kyle Leach. We're happy to have Kyle Leach giving us a, another seminar in addition to the colloquium. Um, uh, this time I'm on the CKM matrix, so uh, Kyle's a faculty member at the Colorado School of Mines. Been working in precision beta decay physics for uh, for many years, and uh, we'll hear about some of the exciting things happening with the top row of the CKM matrix. I think these. Yes, days. and and a little bit of PM, PMS matrix, but yeah, mostly on the CKM matrix. Um, good. Okay. So, uh, it's, I heard David talk a little bit earlier. This, you know, I like the analogy of, of, uh, one of the Charles Dickens novels, A Tale of Two Cities, uh, because it, it's really kind of a mirror of CKM unitarity or the test of CKM unitarity and the PMNS matrix. These two things mathematically are identical in their construction, but empirically the elements within those matrices are very different. And this is one of the places that we think that we can start to search for, for where new physics is starting to hide through the signatures of the matrices. Okay, so new physics, what is it and where do we search? So here's another image. This is kind of a more uh, a less colloquium style image of, of the particles in the standard model and one that's a little bit more suited for seminars. Um, so basically we have three generations of quarks and three generations of leptons and it's these six particles in the normal matter uh, description of the standard model particles, that is what we're going to talk about today. And it's the way that they interact um, differently between whether or not they are interacting uh, with the weak interaction or something else that generates these two matrices. And I'll go through that a little bit in detail. This, everything that we can describe using our standard model, basically only describes uh, about 5% of the energy budget of our universe. So we, if we take our uh, astrophysical probes and we point them basically wherever we care to look in our universe, we see that there's an energy budget uh, that's distributed in some way that looks like this pie graph. And the things that we can describe as ordinary matter, this is what we call uh, the particles of our standard model. So 95% of the energy budget of our universe, as we currently look at it, is not described by this very successful model that we use. So we know that we have something outside of our standard model. And as I'll talk about, as I put in the abstract, and as I'll talk a little bit about today, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. We've entered this era of anomalies where the precision measurements have gotten so good that we're now starting to see what we think could be potential hints of new physics, but those potential hints of new physics historically have also shown us that uh, there's something within our measurements that maybe we don't understand at the level we think. So a lot of the things that I'll show today could be down to this era of anomalies because we've started making measurements um, maybe at a precision level that, that we haven't looked at before. And one example of this is sort of left on flavor universality where across several regimes here, not all of these, this is from a couple of years ago, so some of these are a little bit different now, but you can see that things like mu one g minus two are 4.2 sigma away based on the measurements. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's a 4.2 sigma hint of new physics. It just might mean that we don't actually understand what we think the standard model is predicting at those levels. But just in this one test, you can see that there are many uh, hints that are outside of three sigma um, in terms of uh, in terms of physics that could look like a physically on the standard model. So where does this all lead? First of all, extensions to the standard model at this point are completely unavoidable because we know that neutrinos have non-zero. At least two of the three neutrino mass states are non-zero. So that means anything. Uh, that we talk about in terms of the new standard model or an extension to the standard model has to at least include that. There are tantalizing hints of new physics, but there's conflicting data in these sectors. And this is what we talk about when we say the era of anomalies. Most of these new scenarios hint at particles in the dark sector. And what I really mean by that is that if they were strongly interacting with the, the, the charged forces of the standard model, we would have seen them already. So that means that they have to have some uh, property that allows them to be hidden in the way that we haven't seen them, but still generate effects that we think we're looking for. And we really need a better understanding of this fermion symmetries uh, in the three by three paradigm and whether or not the three by three paradigm is actually the way that, that nature is described. So uh, I love this plot, but it basically shows that when we talk about things that are dark matter, these things that uh, have some coupling to gravity, which again is not part of our standard model, but basically don't seem to interact in any significant way with all the other forces that we include in the standard model, the phase space here experimentally is quite poorly constrained. Um, there are things that exist at the extreme ultra light dark matter stages, which some of the, the work for searching for those things exists uh, here at Yale. There are things in the sub GEV dark matter range, which are sort of light wimp dark matter. And then you get things that are sort of up at the mass scale of, of many solar masses. So all of this, for the most part, 
uh, could potentially be some model uh, that exists that can describe the dark matter in our universe, uh, and trying to narrow this down is challenging. Finding signatures uh, inside of these fundamental symmetries of nature help to allow us uh, to kind of hopefully boil this down a little bit. So let's look at the fermions in the standard model. So here's our fermions. These are the spin one half particles. These are what we call the fermions. Uh, you can see that there's a, a list of different things that are uh, ordered. This is actually on Wikipedia now, which is quite nice. Um, but basically, there's a number of properties that we look at when we're talking about the fermions in our standard model. And, and today's talk really focuses on the nature of those fermions and the way that they interact in the, uh, with the different fields. So we have our quarks. We have three generations of quarks, up, down, charm, strange, top, and bottom. And we have three generations of leptons. We have the electron generation, the mu generation, and the tau generation. Now, as I'll talk about in a little bit, the neutrinos themselves are very interesting. This is one of the things that we'll talk about with the PM and S matrix. But neutrinos in the standard model, we typically write them as electron, mu, and tau. This is not really the quantum particle nature of what the neutrinos are. This is just the way that they happen to interact with the weak interaction uh, that is included in the standard model. So let's compare the two things. Quarks are coupled to the strong weak and electromagnetic forces in the standard model, and the leptons are coupled to the weak and electromagnetic forces only. However, because these two things have some overlap, you can start to probe them in radioactive nuclear decay where you have the transition of one type of quark to another. So this is the laboratory that I'll talk about in a little bit that we use to do this. The quarks have both left-right chirality, so do the charged leptons, but neutrinos only are left chiral in this standard model. This is a little bit bizarre, and there may be some connection to something that we're missing in our standard model that would hint at having this chiral symmetry back in the neutrino sector. You also have color charge and electromagnetic charge with the quarks. Uh, the leptons, the electromagnetic charge ones have masses uh, from the MeV to GeV range. However, the electromagnetic uh, neutral ones, which are our neutrinos, they have very, very unnaturally small masses, but they're at least two of the states are non-zero. I'll talk more about that in a minute. So let's take a look at a plot that shows the relative masses. So for the quarks, they sort of have some trend that looks like this, and they're all more or less grouped in, in a fairly close range. The charged leptons also take a similar trend, and they have roughly uh, a similar mass scale. But the neutrinos are many, about six orders of magnitude lighter than the mass of the electron. Now, curiosity, I will say it's more nothing more than a curiosity. If I draw a line and say that somehow there is some fundamental mass scale that's determined by the heaviest fermion in the standard model, which is a top quark, and I draw, uh, and I basically look at what the, the scale from the mass of the top quark is to the grand unification scale, and the scale of the top quark down to the neutrinos, you get roughly about 14 orders of magnitude uh, in mass between those two. It's a curiosity. I think it's nothing more than that, but you know, since we're talking about symmetries, this is a, a, something interesting that we can point to. So critically with the neutrino masses, we don't know what they are, but at least two of them are non-zero or less we would not see the, the oscillation patterns that we currently see. So even between two seemingly symmetric set of particles, and certainly when we talk about the PMNS and CPM matrices, the mathematical formalism that goes into generating them is the same, there appear to be differences that we really don't understand. Uh, and it's these differences that I think can lead us in the right direction uh, to where we start looking for uh, extensions to the standard model. And that brings us to the three by three paradigm. So in the standard model, the mass and weak eigenstates of the quarks and leptons are not equal to each other. And they're related through two rotation matrices, which the first order are symmetric. So the CKM matrix is the quark mixing matrix. It stands for Kabiba, Kobayashi, Maskawa matrix. Uh, and what it does is it relates the way that the quarks interact with the weak interaction to the way that they interact with the strong interaction. Okay. This, uh, these are the different elements. So you have BUD, BUS, BUB, and so on. So this is called the top row. I think this is the second row and third row, but top row is what we'll talk about today. And then on the other side, you have the PMNS matrix, which is the lepton mixing matrix. And this stands for the Ponte Corvo, uh, whatever, I can't remember all the rest of them, a bunch of names. Yeah. Um, and so here you relate the, what we call the flavor eigenstates or the weak interaction eigenstates of the neutrinos to their mass states. And as I said before, the weak interaction eigenstates are just the way that they happen to couple to our standard model. And the mass eigenstates are really the particle nature of what the neutrinos are. Um, but of course, we're going to talk mostly about the electron flavor because I'm going to talk about the way things are emitted in radioactive nuclear decay, which produces an electro, uh, a electron neutrino, uh, which is some superposition of these three mass states determined by the top row of the PMNS matrix. 
So for the standard model description of these two fundamental fermion matrices to be complete, these two matrices have to be a unitary transformation. It's a fundamental tenet of the standard model that for these to be complete theories, they have to be a unitary transformation. Unitary transformation for, for these matrices implies that the sum of the squares of any row or column have to be identically one. So what we search for in many of these ways uh, is what the relative magnitudes of these elements look like. The CKM matrix is largely a diagonal matrix, and I'll show how we test this uh, in a few slides, but the PMNS matrix is highly mixed. It is very much a not diagonal matrix. So although there is an identical mathematical formalism that formulates both of these matrices, empirically, the elements in the matrix are very different. <clears throat> so this is one of the hints that there is something that we fundamentally don't understand in this segment. So for the quark matrix, these are probed via semi-electronic decays of hadrons, right? You basically are looking at transitions uh, between the quarks. And this is what gets these, and, and you end up with semi-electronic decay because you observe, in most cases, the leptons that are produced. The PMNS matrix, the elements themselves are probed via oscillation experiments, and you can search for the masses to try to understand some mass information as well. As I'll go through in a little bit, there's currently about a three sigma tension in the top row unitarity condition of the CKM matrix. So it's three sigma below one. If something, as I'll talk about in a second, if it's below one, it means that we're missing some physics fundamentally in, in the standard model. And on the PMNS side, there may be some, so currently it is unitary, but there, it's not as well tested at, uh, as high precision as the CKM matrix. Um, and these elements may in fact indicate hidden symmetries uh, somewhere for the neutrinos. So these things, uh, a comparison of these two matrices, uh, hopefully, will give us some hints that where beyond standard model physics might lie that connects these two sectors together. Okay, so there's a few ways we can go about searching for these. We can do direct tests of the unitary condition for the matrices. That means measuring the elements, squaring them and adding them together within their uncertainties. So we can do that through oscillations and we can do that through hydronic or leptonic decay. And you can search for additional generations through new particles. So for example, if the three by three paradigm is not complete, then that means if you are searching for additional mass states for the neutrino or additional flavor states for the neutrino, since these must be unitary transformations, uh, you could think about extending this from a three by three matrix to an n by n matrix, which would then in itself be unitary. So are quarks of new masses observed? Well, no, not yet. We would see something that's strongly interacting in principle. We would have seen that. Um, are neutrinos of new masses observed? Maybe that is something interesting because not seeing neutrinos may not tell us that we that, that doesn't actually exist because they're very hard to see. In our case, we use nuclear beta decay in both instances to probe these two matrices to high precision. So first we need to ask ourselves a few questions if we're going to start using beta decay as a probe. First one is what can we uniquely probe in the era of the LHC? So we're talking about beta decay. If we're talking about new physics on the TEV scale or implications of new physics on the TEV scale, we better make sure that what we're probing has not already been ruled out uh, by direct collision measurements at the LHC. Are the model predictions of observable couplings to beyond standard model physics within reach of us? So these are uh, basically sine squared uh, mixing angles with the electron flavor as a function of the mass of a potential sterile neutrino. And you can see that some of these things down here are part of 10 to the 13. So in principle, you can generate 10 to the 13 decays, but whether or not your experiment is actually sensitive at a part of 10 to the 13 is probably something you don't want to rely on when you're talking about doing uh, experiments with nuclear atoms, at least in this context. And finally, one of the big uh, challenges that the nuclear physics community has faced over the many years, do we really understand the nuclear and atomic structures well enough to do particle physics uh, using these sort of complex systems? Now, I wouldn't be up here giving the colloquium if the answer to these were no. So the answer is yes in most of the cases, but it's not easy. And so here's a few of the things I'm going to talk about today that we use to do these studies. Something called beta neutrino angular correlations. So beta neutrino angular correlations is basically uh, energy and momentum conservation in radioactive beta decay. You measure the energy and angle that's between the beta particle and the neutrino. If that does not conserve energy and momentum, it hints at the fact that there is some fundamental particle that you're missing in that decay. This is a search for extensions to the vector minus axial vector description of the weak interaction. So this is searching for scalar and tensor currents in the weak interaction. Neutrinos double beta decay. Can lepton number be violated? And are neutrinos fundamental Majorana fermions? In principle, as I'll show in a slide, there are Majorana phases that can exist potentially within the PMNS matrix. Beta spectrum shape measurements. What is the absolute mass scale of the neutrino? 
So this we search for with high precision currently at the moment using tritium beta decay, looking at the endpoint. The two that I'm going to talk the most about are something called super allowed Fermi beta decay. It's a very specific class of nuclear decay where you uh, eliminate most of these uh, nuclear complicated nuclear structure effects. This is a search for whether or not there are more than three generations of quarks. And we can also do the same thing on the left-hand side, where you can use decay momentum reconstruction, as I talked about yesterday, to search for signatures of heavy neutrino mass states outside of the one, two, three paradigm. Uh, and the other question is, are there even other particles that can couple to the standard model that might have some effect on these two matrices? So we'll start with the CKM matrix. This is the one I've worked on for the longest time. And in some sense, it's, it's uh, the one that we perhaps know the most about. So what we typically do is we use the top row unitarity test. And you can see that this is a largely diagonal matrix. And so the up-down element, so the things that can connect the up and down quarks, is by far the uh, largest contributing member of this top row unitarity test. Now, we can do this in beta decay. Because in beta decay, you convert a proton to a neutron or a neutron to a proton. All you're really doing is flipping an up quark to a down quark or a down quark to an up quark. So you're directly probing the coupling at the quark level uh, of this BUD element. This is the coupling of the up down quarks uh, between the weak and strong interaction. And that in beta decay is exactly the vertex that you look at. So standard model says that CKM matrix should be unitary. So that means, as I said, if I sum the squares uh, of the top row elements, I should get exactly one. If it's not one, then it means I'm missing something. I'm missing some other additional generation. So this non-unitarity condition could signal new physics after generation of quarks, extra Z bosons, some form of supersymmetric uh, particle. These types of things can affect the strong weak couplings of the quarks. So let's take, for example, uh, a diagram here. So this is, there's going to be obvious, the proton doesn't pay to the neutron, just to be very clear. Um, but you imagine that these are bound within some parent nucleus and some daughter nucleus. And there's a reason I draw it in this way. And that is that all of the searches that we use to understand the element VUD uses these positron emitting decays. So that is the conversion of an up quark to a down quark rather than the other way around. So you imagine that this is bound in some side, inside of some unstable nucleus, and this neutron is also bound in some, inside of some other unstable nucleus. You have an up-down coupling. This is what the transition happens when you undergo uh, nuclear beta decay. At this vertex, you have the weak interaction strength G times this coupling that connects the strong interaction and the weak interaction. This is VUD. This is basically the rotation going from weak uh, to strong. You have the emission of a W plus boson, and then you have the emission of the things that you normally see, which is a, a normal matter electron neutrino and a positron. So this is nuclear beta plus decay. So if we now use Fermi's golden rule, we can basically say that the decay rate of this radioactive decay is proportional to its density of final states and the matrix element that connects the initial and final nuclear states together. This we can calculate. This is effectively a phase space factor. It has to do with the amount of energy that exists and the number of states that you can decay to. This MFI here, this is complicated, right? This has to do with the spatial uh, overlap of the wave function between the initial state and the final state. And we're talking about initial and final nuclear states, uh, nuclear and atomic to some extent. Um, nuclear wave functions are incredibly challenging to, comp uh, to compute at the precision level that we want to do tests of the standard model. Now, we typically write these, this is a very old way of doing it, but we typically write this lambda, which is a decay rate. So this is decays per second in essence, it's a probability. We typically write this as something we call an FT value. FT here is basically, F stands for the phase space, I'll talk about that in a second, and T is the partial half-life to a particular radioactive decay mode. You can see here that there's a whole bunch of constants, and which we can all group together, and in the end, once you group these constants together, on the bottom, you're left with the weak interaction strength, G, and this matrix element, M squared. So that means if you can somehow figure out what this matrix element is, you have direct access to the weak interaction, the fundamental weak interaction strength using beta decay. But as I said, this MFI is very complicated. And we can experimentally get the left-hand side of this expression, F and T. So F is a phase space integral. It depends on the Q value of the decay. So we measure Q values. Uh, very precisely by doing atomic mass measurements of the initial and final parent nuclei, or the, the parent nucleus and the daughter nucleus. So we do these in petting traps, and we can do these at sort of a part per billion level. We can measure the half-lives very precisely of these systems, and we can measure the branches to the particular decay modes uh, that we try to look for as well. So these are the three quantities that we have to measure, 
And then at some point, we're going to have to deal with this matrix. So we'll, we'll leave that aside for now. Okay. So in general, these beta decay FT values can span 20 orders of magnitude. It's a huge range that you can span. If you remember from the angular momentum classifications of beta decay, if your beta particle, or if you carry away zero units of angular momentum in beta decay, we call that an allowed transition. Okay. Now, allowed and forbidden in beta decay don't actually mean allowed and forbidden. They mean favorable and then suppressed. So if you now carry away one unit, two units, three units of angular momentum, you're talking about first, second, and third forbidden beta decays. They're not actually forbidden, they're just suppressed. And if we're talking about the spin classification, so this is the intrinsic spin, it's the correlated spins between the electron and the neutrino. If they are anti-aligned with each other, we get a total beta spin of zero. We call that a vector decay or a Fermi decay. This is, this is basically a vector uh, part of the weak interaction. And if they're aligned with each other, so if they're anti-aligned, you get spin of zero. If they're aligned with each other, either up or down, this is called an axial vector part of the weak interaction or a gamma of Teller beta decay. Now, in principle, both of these are allowed, right? You can couple any possible angular momentum. So you have to conserve angular momentum. You're not allowed to violate any angular momentum conservation rules. But what you can do is you're allowed to have any possible combination of these two things within the difference uh, of the parent and daughter angular momentum. So that means that in practice, most decays are some combination of both vector and axial vector. And this is why the weak interaction has this V minus A structure. However, we are very specifically trying to search for something that makes our life a lot easier when we try to extract BUD. So what we do is we search for nuclei that have pure vector transitions. So if I now go from a zero plus parent state to a zero plus daughter state, there's only one possible way that I can do that. And that is using an allowed transition that is a pure Fermi transition. So that is what we call an, an allowed Fermi transition. And if we do that, no possible axial vector contribution is allowed to that decay, simply through angular momentum selection rules. Okay, it would violate a conservation of angular momentum. So that means this G squared times this complicated matrix element now is just the vector part of the weak interaction. So that's why we get GV squared here. And you not only get the Fermi part of this matrix element. So we've simplified the matrix element a little bit. But now we need to, at some point, deal with this. The way we do this is we now say, all right, let's forget what we know about the differences between protons and neutrons. The first order, the proton and the neutron are exactly the same thing. They have basically the same mass. Um, the only difference between them is that one is charged and one is not charged. So we can say that the proton and neutron are actually one particle, what we call the nucleon. And we can say that the proton and neutron are just isospin projections of that nu nucleon. So the nucleon will have spin one half, and the isospin projection will either be plus one half or minus one half. So just like we do with uh, angular momentum ladder operators, we can now use a ladder operator under this assumption that you have pure isospin symmetry. You can use a ladder operator to go up and down between the two different states. That now means that the matrix element that connects them is just some value that's determined by the ladder operator. So if we do that between these very specific things that we call isobaric analog states, which are nuclear states that uh, are very similar to each other, except one of them has uh, a spin minus one half nucleon and one has a spin plus one half nucleon. So the difference between a proton and a neutron in the initial and final states, this ladder operator now becomes the number two. So we've now taken this complicated nuclear matrix element and under isospin symmetry, it basically said, this can now be two. Now we know K, Two is a constant, GB is a constant. In principle, all of the nuclei that satisfy this condition should all have exactly the same FT value, empirically measured. Remember, FT values spin 20 orders of magnitude. So this is a fairly uh, unlikely thing to happen if nature is not kind of the way that we're assuming it looks like. So that means if these conserved vector currents, which basically means that there's no renormalization in the nuclear medium, uh, and so that you basically end up in a situation where all of these are actually constant. And that means that this vector part of the weak interaction should never change. It should always remain the same, regardless of what nucleus you set it, as long as they satisfy this condition here. So this was identified for the first time by Sharon Gerhardt in the 50s, the early 50s. Uh, and basically what they looked at uh, was experimental evidence for this fir pure Fermi interaction of the beta decay of two nuclei that they understood satisfied this, oxygen 14 and carbon 10. In fact, these are the two lightest nuclei that satisfy this condition. They're both uh, beta unstable. 
and, and shortly. So what they did in the 50s was they performed carbon 10 and oxygen 14 beta decay experiments to these analog states in their respective daughters. So these are zero plus to zero plus nuclear decays between uh, isospin, total isospin one states. So this is the criteria that we use for these super loud Fermi beta decays. And from the Fermi theory of beta decay, they noted that the FT value should be equal. And as they found, so I can plot this on this chart, even though the uncertainties are fairly large, they're actually equal. And remember, they, they could in principle span 20 orders of magnitude. So these are equal. This is not a, a log scale. This is, this is FT in linear scale. So there is some region here within one sigma where those two things are equal. And they say in their paper that while the FT values agree within the rather large limits of error, it's hoped that accurate measurements of the positron energies will make it possible to arrive at more definite conclusions. So this already in the 50s was done. The challenging part was that these are very unstable systems, right? The half-lives of these are seconds or less. So in the 50s, it was very difficult to produce these. Now, since the early 1900s, we've been able to produce uh, radioisotopes with much better fidelity, and especially going to uh, more exotic systems. As I'll show, we need to go to very exotic systems to do a lot of these tests. And in fact, we have a whole bunch of, I showed this yesterday, but we have a whole bunch of uh, facilities around the world that are able to produce these rare isotope beams. Uh, and the ones uh, specifically here in North America that can do that are the Triumph facility in Vancouver, Canada, which I'm going to talk about in a second, uh, which has a, a major super allowed physics uh, program, uh, and EPRIN, which is uh, the newest facility uh, at Michigan State University. So, over the past, this even this slide is all the way up to date. This is from a review that, that Jason Holt and myself did in, in 2018. Um, at the Triumph ISAC facility in Vancouver, Canada, we've studied a number of these uh, cases uh, across the nuclear chart. And you can see this red line here represents the N equals Z line. So that means you have the same number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus, which is one of these conditions for getting uh, this cancellation that gives you the matrix element of two. Um, and you can see that these ones that are colored are the ones that are stable. So as you get to heavier and heavier masses, you start to diverge away from this N equals Z line, uh, which also means that you now are going further and further from stability, which makes it much harder to produce at radioactive beam facilities. Uh, and in fact, rubidium-74 is a half-life, I think, of 70 milliseconds or something like that. So they're, they're challenging to do experiments on. Now, the way that we do them, we can do all three of those measurements I had mentioned before, uh, mass, atomic masses, uh, branching ratio measurements and precision half-life measurements. We can do all three of those at Triumph using the radioactive beams that, uh, that we have. And you can see on each one of these papers, it's half-life branching ratio or Q value. This is charge radius, so this is an atomic physics measurement. Um, but we make uh, precision measurements using penning traps of the initial and final state atomic masses. We can use high resolution, uh, high efficiency gamma ray spectrometers to measure the branching fractions using gamma decay. And we can implant into gas proportional counters, basically ionization chambers, um, to do precision half-life measurements. So over the many years that we've been doing this since the 50s, picture in 1953 in Sharon Gerhardt's paper looks something like this. And since then now, this is sort of the picture. This even this is a, a couple of years old because this was a review in 2015. But you can see that we've not only continued to make the measurements on carbon 10 and oxygen 14, but we've now actually extended it out, and they are equal. Remember, 20 orders of magnitude in principle uh, difference. These are the FT values for all of these different uh, radioactive decaying systems. So this is a success. These are all, they all line up. But of course, we're, we want to do things to high precision, right? We made some fundamental assumption way back when we first started looking at why we wanted to use these specific nuclei that said that isospin is, a, isospin is an exact symmetry of nature, which we know is not true. Proton and neutron are not exactly the same as each other. So that means that these aren't totally equal. And in fact, they differ at about the 1% level. But we want to make precision measurements at well below this level, at the 0.1 or 0.01% level. So that means we now need to correct for the fact that we somehow assumed that we had uh, isospin, a good isospin symmetry in the beginning. So there's more than just doing that as well. So this, we have the isospin symmetry breaking correction, delta C. This is what I was talking about where we assumed isospin symmetry was good. Uh, we also need to make a nucleus-dependent radiative correction. So these are about radiative effects inside of the nucleus uh, that slightly change uh, some of the decay properties that we observe. And there's also this nucleus-independent radiative correction that results from the calculation of the so-called gamma W box uh, for, for radiative decays. 
Once we make these corrections, now we have something that is constant to a part in 10 to the four. This is the value that in principle we can use to extract a VUD from these measurements. Can I ask a question? So how are yeah. these corrections calculated? Are they- models? I'm gonna go right into that, yeah. So this, this is where everything kind of goes crazy. And this is the you know the best of times. It was the worst of times. I mean, the fact that all these things agree much better than the error bars suggests they should. Should I read anything into that? So the uncertainties on each one of the individual error bars are, in this case, dominated by the nuclear structure on theoretical correction uncertainty, which is um, chaos at the moment because they're really challenging to do at this precision level. And and as a result, we typically inflate the uncertainties. Um, and then what you do in the end is you. Uh, I think they inflate, uh, I can't remember how they do the review, but somehow they, they edit the fact that the total uncertainty on the average FT value is reflects the fact that these things are, uh, the error bars on these are too large when you do the average. But it's also not clear that um, these things should in principle line up either. So I'll get to that in a second. Okay. So if we want to extract VUD from the experimental data, we now need to think about what in principle you can use to extract VUD. So I've been talking about these zero plus to zero plus decays, um, but you can also use the decay of the neutron. You can use the decay of these so-called mirror nuclei, which is things that are very similar to super lab decays, but not quite. Or you can use the pion decay. Now each of these have different challenges. So the pion decay, the branch that you're looking at in the pion decay, I think is a part of 10 to the seven or 10 to the nine. So experimentally, it's very difficult to do this measurement at the precision level you need, but the advantage is that you have no nuclear structure correction because it's not a nucleus, it's a pile. You get some radiative decay uh, corrections you need to worry about, but it's smaller than all the other ones because uh, we understand better the radiative effects uh, from these decays from the pion. The mirror nuclei, they suffer from basically everything that you suffer from in zero plus to zero plus decays, uh, these radiative effects and the nuclear structure effects. Um, but not only that, on top of that, it's not a pure Fermi decay. So you now need to measure the fraction of Fermi to gamma teller. Uh, so it makes it even more difficult. That's why the experiments are harder to do. The neutron, in principle, you don't have a nuclear structure correction because it's not a nucleus, it's a nucleon. Um, the radiative correction is about the same size as zero plus to zero plus decay, but there's this pesky problem with the neutron that the lifetime is kind of chaos at the moment. Depending on how you measure the neutron lifetime, whether you trap it or whether you do it in a beam, you get two different answers. And there have been many experiments done, and they both seem to get this, this difference. So this causes a problem with, with the neutron uh, extraction of, of this value from the neutron experiment side. And from the zero plus to zero plus side, we spent many years getting experiment down to a reasonable level. And now we have a problem where the nuclear structure corrections here are large. Uh, and theoretically, this is a challenging thing for us to make. So the precision of the super lot data is better than 0.1%. And in most cases, it's 0.01% on the experimental side but we're limited by our ability to calculate uh, these corrections that have to go into the extraction that we want. Okay, so in the 2015 uh, Hardy and Town Review, you can take VUD from the super allowed data, you get VUS from the particle data group, which is from K on decay basically, and within, even within this precision level, VUB, uh, when you sum and square it, is, is well below the, the uh, level of uncertainty of that error bar. So this number here is consistent with one. So everything's funky dory, right? However, just after that, uh, there was a bombshell in the community that went off, which was basically that these, this inner radiative correction uh, for years had been realized that it may not have been calculated in a totally consistent way. And so what the group of Chinya and Man Misha did was they started looking at using a dispersion relation to calculate this hadronic gamma W box. So I'll show what that is on the next slide. Um, and so basically what they found was a completely different irradiated correction that applies to everything. So that doesn't just apply to uh, the super allowed decays, it applies to the neutron, the mirror, and in some essence, the pion as well. And what they found was that this difference now creates uh, a change in the value for VUD, which raises tension at that time, it was about four sigma with the top row of the CKM unitary. So it now became four sigma low just by the fact that they were able to use more modern uh, theoretical techniques to calculate the so-called gamma W box. So this is the gamma W box. It's a radiative correction that goes into these decays. It has to do with the hadronic uncertainties. This, this delta R here is what it comes from. 
So if we go back in time to 2005, Marciano and Serlin, actually it's 2006, Marciano and Serlin published what was the seminal paper on the calculation for this irradiated correction. And it was calculated at this value here. Then we have the bombshell paper go off in 2018. And from there, a number of groups, including Marciano and Serlin, recalculated and found that the old assumptions that they made in 2006 were incorrect. And so now we're sort of converging on a new value that within the precision level that we're able to achieve experimentally makes a huge difference. So what does that do to VUD? Well, now I can take this back to the 90s. So the 90s was really when we started first looking at doing precision tests of the standard model. Uh, this was uh, Ian Towner and John Hardy that spent a, a career of basically looking at these things. So on the y-axis, I have the value for VUD. And on the x-axis, I have the year of the publication. And you can see that there are fairly large error bars. But more or less, these things kind of stay in consistency with each other until you get to the point of 2018 where this new radiative correction uh, is applied. Corresponding to that same time frame, the particle data group decided to reevaluate the way that they were doing K on decays. So they started including additional K on decay channels that now started being measured with higher precision. And you started to get uh, a now a shift, even though it was within one sigma of what was evaluated previously, uh, this shift now and the reduction in the error bars also added to the tension with the top row unitarity condition. So if we take a look at the picture and the way it looks now, this solid line here, so this is now VUS plotted as a function of VUD. Remember, VUB does not contribute here. So this is the phase space really that we're looking at. This line represents one. This is the unitarity one. So if you sum and square these two things, you get this line. Currently, there is about three sigma tension in the super allowed zero plus to zero plus data from this unitarity line. And there's something weird going on between the different ways that people evaluate K on decay. So right now, we are currently low in the unitarity condition by about three sigma. It's about 2.8 sigma. So this VUD is the most precisely measured quantity. It's also the one that dominates in the sum. And this is the one that we obtained from beta decay. So currently at the moment, we are in tension with the standard model. This is now the sum of the squares of all three of them. Here's one in the red line, and we are below. So this is, again, I didn't update this block for today's thing, but uh, this was the status in 2018. It's more or less the same status uh, still today. So currently, the CKM top rate unitarity condition is not satisfied at about the three sigma level. This is confusing. Um, one of the possible explanations is the fact that these nuclear structure corrections, if I go back here, these, these delta C corrections, these are incredibly challenging to do. However, we, uh, myself and, and the theory colleague of mine at Triumph, have started doing a reevaluation of these calculations using modern ab initio style nuclear structure theory. Um, and so our hope is that these delta C corrections, at least in a self consistent way, we can make uh, better experimental uncertainty or better theoretical uncertainties on those quantities. So, this Sorry, can I ask about you? You have like five points on this plot, but there's two groups of authors, right? Essentially. Yeah. So should we assume that correlated people with the same names are using the same methods in these points? Or? So, yes. So in principle, this one here, I think they reuse, so this is the same theoretical calculation, uh, but they reuse a different set of data to constrain one of the parameters. So these are super correlated. They're super correlated, that's right. Yeah, so this, I mean, the, the real jump is this business here. This was a slide I got from, from Max, and uh, uh, he basically was trying to show that uh, there have been multiple well, okay, there's been two different groups, the original group and then Marciano and Serlin recalculated this, and they also found that their old calculation uh, was not correct, or they were missing something. Okay, so that's the current status of, of the top row unitarity test for the CKM matrix. Now, you can use those same systems to search for other things uh, that we don't really fully understand in, in the standard model. Like, for example, there is no fundamental reason why the weak interaction should be of a vector minus axial vector nature. In principle, you can also have scalar, tensile, and pseudoscalar contributions uh, within the effective standard model Lagrangian. So you can see the vector minus axial vector, uh, so the, these colored ones here represent uh, sort of right-handed tensor pseudoscalar uh, scalar currents. So these are beyond standard model terms in the standard model Lagrangian. But this gamma mu times one minus gamma five, that's B minus A, that's vector minus axial vector. So we know that there's other beyond standard model physics in nature. 
We know that there's not enough baryon violation in the standard model to describe what we see today. And we know there's not enough CP violation in the standard model to, to describe the current universe that we live in. So one of the possible descriptions is that you need to add some terms to the standard model we run in that allow for certain things like this. So we can do precision tests of this using beta decay, allowing these exotic interactions. So this would be a scalar contribution to the vector part of the weak interaction, and this would be a tensor contribution to the axial vector part of the weak interaction. So what we do is we measure the shape of the electron spectrum emitted in beta decay. So we have a standard model. We can multiply it by some fraction that has this Fierce interference term. And this Fierce interference term is proportional to things that contain scalar and tensor currents. So this modifies the shape of the beta spectrum. And if we can make a high precision measurement of that beta spectrum and we compare it with the standard model prediction or the standard model prediction with some contributions of these, then we can test whether or not this may uh, reproduce what we observe in nature. So we can do nuclear recoil spectroscopy with short-lived radioisotopes to do this. So in our search for beyond standard model physics, we can again use these super loud and mirror nuclear transitions that I discussed before. And if one plots the, the current limits for scalar contributions as a function of tensor contributions in the weak interaction, even with the beta decay limits as they currently are, which in this sector are not as precise as we can make them, we just haven't had the experimental tools uh, at hand, which we, we are starting to obtain now. Even with the limited values we already have, we're already competitive with what the, uh, the limits the LHC can, can give. So this implies physics, new physics sort of on the TEV or tens of TEV scale. Now, the systems that we need to study are these N equals Z systems. So they're exotic, they have short lifetimes that makes them hard to study. Um, and they're neutron deficient systems. So we have to worry about the beta plus to electron capture fraction in those decays. But measurements of the nuclear recoil uh, are uniquely sensitive probes of this weak beyond standard model physics. And so in principle, Dave, that kind of goes towards the recoil measurements that we could do with the spheres. Um, but in our case, what we do is we use these superconductors to make direct recoil measurements. Um, but now we're talking about nuclear recoil sort of in the few electron volt uh, spectrum ranges that we need to be able to make our way down there. So just as an example, carbon 11 is, is one of the main cases that we want to study here. Um, if I take a look at the beta spectrum or the positron spectrum that you get uh, from, from beta plus decay of carbon 11, it truncates at about 1 MeV. It has a Q value of about 1 MeV. When I now look at trying to do this with electron, or sorry, with recoils, you can see now this is in KeV. Now we're talking about 90 electron volts as the maximum uh, recoil energy for the boron 11 daughter that's created. So the beauty is that using beta plus decay, you actually, because uh, you have in the Fermi function, when you have a positron that's emitted from the core of the nucleus or a nucleon inside of the nucleus, the nucleus is a positively charged object. The positron is a positively charged object. The positron is accelerated through the potential of the nucleus. And so at very low energies, uh, you actually get a very clean region to make these measurements because you don't end up with positron crunch positron contribution below a certain uh, energy because that uh, positron is accelerated out of the nucleus. So you get a, a slightly different shape for positron decay versus uh, beta minus decay. So the way that we plan to do this, as I touched on a little bit yesterday, is taking these superconducting tunnel junctions that we have, these very sensitive, low energy uh, superconducting sensors, and we now want to take these short-lived radioisotopes that live for hundreds of milliseconds to a few seconds, we pass them through a series of windows and we directly implant them inside of the superconducting arrays that we have here. So the beam requirements here uh, can be fairly strict, but we're able to pass them through the various windows and tune the energy in such a way that you can get them where you plan to get them. So for a given energy, you know, we've been doing this for many years, so we're, we're able to do it fairly well. Um, a 1% energy spread, which is what the effort beam will, will give us, gives us about 50 nanometer width in the depth profile, so we can make the sensor uh, thickness uh, compatible with that. And the total carbon 11 we need to achieve our goal is about 10 to the 7 decays, which is less than two days of feed at 100 particles per second. And effort can produce much, much more than this. Uh, and the purity that we can get is about a part in 10 to the 6. So that means we get a really pure beam of carbon 11 uh, and we can sort of tune it at the energies that we want. And so they're carbon isotopes, or what are the impurities? I mean, are they? No, it's all mass 11, so it's oh. mass to charge. Uh, and so do they pile up the low energies and mess you up or not? Uh, no. So basically what you do is you have a combination. So you have a magnetic spectrograph that does a mass to charge separation. That's good at a precision. That does a separation at a part in 10,000 or something like that, uh, mass to charge. 
uh, but also you selectively ionize the carbon. So you you only, I mean, it's a part of 10 to the six, but you only get carbon beams and you only get carbon beams that are at a mass return ratio of 11. Um, there are, you know, for example, when we study oxygen 14, you get tons of nitrogen 14 that there's so much of it everywhere that even the tails of that sometimes will bleed in. But in this case, it's, it's pure. So we do this at the facility for our isotope beams, or we're planning to do this at EPRIV. Here's a picture of what the um, of what the fridge looks like. Uh, this is a 300k shield that we pop off when we put it in the beam line, and you can see we get get direct access uh, to the uh, to the superconducting sensors. Here's kind of a, a schematic diagram of the way EPRIV laid it all out. Uh, the beam comes in from down here. It's a reaccelerated beam because we need to go through several windows, so we need to have an energy uh, that allows us to do that. And then eventually we implant it into this thing, which is uh, in the, on this general purpose line in the read three hall. Uh, and currently, oh, this is a, a slide that I updated for yesterday, but then forgot to update it for today. Uh, it's actually gonna be uh, delivered to effort next week. So uh, things are all built and they're all being tested and things are going well. Okay, so where are we headed for this? What cases do we actually want to study? So let's say we're gonna look at BUD again. We can actually do this to look at BUD. All of the zero plus to zero plus nuclear data set gives us a line with a precision uh, that looks something like this line right here. If I now take the mirrors, I said they were experimentally less certain because you now had to measure an additional quantity. You now get this far when you extract BUD from the nuclear mirror interface. But all I did was measure the single carbon 11, this A beta nu, which is the uh, beta neutrino angular correlation parameter. It's related to this fierce interference term that I would mentioned before. All I do is measure this carbon 11 to 0.1%, I already do as well as the entire zero plus to zero plus nuclear data set. And I do much better than the mirrors. And this is a, a nuclear mirror case. So if I measure to 0.4% that I get the exact same precision uh, as all of the mirrors combined. So this is something that we can do in principle. So these re the reason we can do it is that recoil spectroscopy has basically order one sensitivity to this rho parameter. Rho is the mixing between axial vector and vector. And you now get a direct measurement of this VUD quantity. You can measure this FT value for the mirror parameters. And so you can see over here, the change in the nuclear, this is a nuclear recoil momentum, but the change in recoil momentum as a function of the shape in the spectrum, depending on what you assume for this A parameter, A parameter goes into row here, changes the spectrum dramatically. So by measuring uh, differences, in the spectrum, we have a very high sensitivity probe of these scalar and tensor contributions to the weak interaction. This is also critical for the extraction of BUD from the mirror data set, but that is a little bit less because uh, the super allowed data set is so good that this uh, would basically just add to that data set and, and provide slight improvement in, in, uh, in precision. So if we're talking about doing this with our new setup, what does the statistical sensitivity to be on standard, standard model physics look like in the recoils? So if we assume we want 10, here now I assume we want 10 to the 8 decays, uh, we do recoil spectroscopy on all of the mirrors, or at least these are all the cases that we might think about doing. Um, and we're looking for a precision of about a part in 10 to the 4. We can essentially do this with carbon 11 and neon 19, which have very high sensitivity uh, cases to be. So this is a simulation of what we would expect for that recoil spectrum. We can already reach 10 to the 8 decays of one day with 128 pixels. And we're working on, so this is uh, Lander, who's my co-PI on this, who's at the LPC call in France, and it, uh, Drew Marino, who's my post or my uh, PhD student uh, at Mines. So they're currently working on a systematics budget um, for the first physics case that we want to study here for carbon 11 and neon 19. Okay. So that was the CKM discussion. Uh, the PMNS discussion will be much shorter. Don't worry, Dave, I'm not in. Um, so again, we have this same, uh, three by three paradigm uh, in the standard model for neutrinos. But now we want to start thinking about, well, what if we do the same unitarity test, but we now do it for neutrinos? But we can think about doing it for the top row. And that's great because the top row is how it couples to our electron flavor. And the electron flavor is what we emit in, in nuclear beta decay. So that means in principle, we have some handle on, on this uh, uh, unitarity condition. So if the sum of the squares is equal to one, uh, then that means it's unitary. Now, unlike the CKM matrix, the PMS, PMNS matrix is very much not diagonal. It's a heavily mixed matrix. This garners a whole lot of speculation, and in fact, it's known as the flavor puzzle. 
Uh, and it's one of the big open questions in subatomic physics. Why is the difference between the PM and S matrix uh, so large compared to the CKM matrix? CM, the CKM matrix has very minimal mixing. PM and S matrix seem to have massive mixing. So let's put this all together. We have our standard model, but we know that the standard model description of neutrinos is incorrect. The fact that oscillations have been observed is the way that we infer that at least two of the three neutrino mass states are non-zero. This is the first and only known violation of the standard model as it's been constructed. So as we search for beyond standard model physics, this is it. This is the beyond standard model physics that we currently have, at least as the way the standard model was constructed. There's things like dark matter and gravity and stuff that aren't included in the standard model. But in terms of what the standard model can describe, this is, uh, this is where we look. This is where we look and have seen something first. So any extension to the standard model has to include non-zero neutrino masses. And those masses are really light. They're six orders of magnitude lighter than the mass of the electron. So we can extract what the absolute mass scale looks like in a number of ways. We can use cosmology, which is model dependent. We can use neutrinoless double beta decay, which requires the neutrino to be a Majorana fermion. Or we can use uh, direct endpoint measurements in tritium beta decay, which currently sets the best laboratory limits. All of these currently are consistent, right? They're all upper limits. There are hints of sterile flavor. So the idea is that maybe the three by three paradigm is not correct in the standard model. For neutrinos, possibly there is a fourth flavor state and thus a fourth mass state. So you would get a heavy neutrino that has a mostly right-handed coupling to the standard model. Remember, they're only weakly interacting. The weak interaction is a left-handed chiral interaction. If you have a right-handed particle that can only interact with the weak interaction, it, it doesn't couple, it's sterile to the standard model, it's sterile to the weak interaction. Now, people have claimed to see things like this in the EV scale mass range, but this is kind of another throwing in the hat of, of these anomalies where some groups claim, so this is a claimed observation of a roughly EV scale sterile neutrino. And this region here is an excluded region from another experiment. So there are many of these types of things in this mass range where some experiments claim they've seen something, other experiments claim that that space is ruled out. At the end of the day, the current oscillation best fits are done not using a three by three model, but a three plus plus one model or a three plus N model. Now these are fits to oscillation data, but it may in fact hint that the three by three paradigm in the left on sector is not correct. And there is something that, that's uh, outside of it. These things could satisfy the dark matter problem, could potentially satisfy the baryon asymmetry or help solve the baryon asymmetry of the universe. But in either way, one of the big questions that we as a community try to solve is, is the great neutrino puzzle pointing to multiple missing particles outside of uh, the description in the lepton sector? So let's take a look. Let's break down the PMNS matrix and take a look at it in terms of uh, ways that we typically factorize it. So the PMNS matrix can be parameterized by four values that are measured in oscillation-based experiments. So we have atmospheric oscillation experiments that measure these parameters here. We have the atmospheric and reactor oscillation experiments that can measure these off-diagonal elements here in the center one. Uh, sorry, these off-diagonal elements here in the end of the diagonal. We have the solar oscillation experiments that are sensitive to one, two mixing. And we have neutrino double beta decay experiments that can basically say whether or not there are these Majorana phases uh, that exist. So, it's complicated, but we have a series of measurements uh, that we try to make through these oscillation or laboratory-based experiments to try to search for this. So these are the Majorana phases that we search for, or whether or not the neutrino is in fact a Majorana fermion. And there are things that are CP violating phases, which right now at the moment, I believe there's something like a two or two and a half sigma preference for their neutrinos to be CP violated. This was uh, measured by the Super K collaboration a couple of years ago. Now, if we're going to follow the neutrino mass scale, we again have to extend our standard model Lagrangian to something that's somewhat minimal, but it includes things like right-handed neutrinos and Majorana mass terms. This is a fairly minimal extension to the standard model, but this now tells us we have things to look for. So after electroweak symmetry breaking, this describes six Majorana neutrinos. And of course, maybe this makes sense because if it turns out that the PMNS matrix in the end is not unitary, well, that's fine because it's just a subset of a larger matrix, and any subset of, of a larger unitary matrix in itself doesn't need to be unitary. So that means that you could have an N by N, or this extended PMNS matrix, that is just some subset of the total. And here is sort of the PMNS matrix that we've been looking at so far. These would be the new heavy mass states. 
And these would be the new sterile flavor states, or mostly sterile flavor states. So if I take a look at the three by three paradigm in a moment, remember I, I plot this as a function of its mass because the mass states are really the particle states uh, in the standard model. And these colored regions represent the fraction of each one of the masses that correspond to electron mu or tau interaction with the standard model. These splittings we know from atmospheric oscillation experiments and solar experiments, but these are the mostly active neutrinos. These are the ones that interact with our standard model. They are left-handed in nature, um, but there could be some tiny contribution to these mass states that are right-handed. And we wouldn't know because we mostly see them through the way they interact with our standard model, which is what we build our detectors out of, the standard model particles. And so uh, these sort of right-handed character of these neutrinos, we wouldn't pick up on. So what we can do is perhaps if we now start searching for these N new heavy mass states, now these would be mostly sterile because they would correspond to some sterile flavor state in the PMNS matrix. Now that means you're actually searching for either a sterile right-handed or mostly right-handed flavor or some heavy mass. And the heaviness of this mass scale uh, in principle can be many things. So what we search for are heavy sterile mass states or and or byron fermion, the nature, whether or not the nature of these things are not fermion. So I won't touch on this too much other than flashing up one or two slides here. The way that we search for uh, whether or not the neutrino is a Dirac or Majorana fermion is through a process called nuclear double beta decay, or in principle, neutrinoless nuclear double beta decay. So the way that this works is in the case where single beta decay is energetically forbidden, basically you would have to gain uh, mass in order to do this. There's a second order process that allows it to decay by two, the simultaneous emission of two beta particles. Uh, and there's a number of cases where this is allowed. So you end up with these mass parabolas that look something like this. And in fact, this two neutrino double beta decay is the process that's allowed by the standard model. It's this con conversion uh, of two nucleons inside of the nucleus simultaneously with the emission of two electrons and two neutrinos. And for xenon-136, I picked xenon-136 because that's a, a, a particular interest to people here who do uh, physics with Nexo. Um, this has been measured. So two neutrino double beta decay is measured with a half-life of 10 to the 21 years. So remember, the universe is roughly 10 to the 13 years old. So this is much, much longer than the age of the universe. Now, in principle, you could also have a process now if the neutrino is its own antiparticle, so it's a Meyer on a fermion, and actually those neutrinos annihilate with each other at the initial vertex. And the only thing that you end up seeing is two electrons. And those two electrons now carry away the total sum of the decay energy. Now, and this has never been seen. The current limit on xenon-136 is greater than 2.3, 10 to the six years at 90%. And that was published last year in PRL by the Campbell and Zen collaboration. Now, why do we care so much about neutrinoless double beta decay? Because it is a smoking gun in physics and it requires beyond standard model physics to take place. You may not know exactly what that physics is, but you know that if you measure a final state that contains only two electrons and you do energy momentum conservation, doesn't matter what happens in here. This is called the Schechter Valley black box. Doesn't really matter what happens inside um, because you know that you've seen beyond standard model physics. So the only way that you can end up with the final products given the initial system is if you have a minor on a fermion and you violate lepton number. So both of those things are not allowed within the standard model. So you get this huge two neutrino double beta decay spectrum from the electrons. This is our standard model physics. And you look for a tiny little blip that is the sum of those two electrons if they don't conserve energy and momentum with the neutrinos. Uh, and that is your beyond standard model physics signal. And there's three experiments at the moment, all, all of which are being planned on the roughly the ton scale of the 700 or several hundred million dollar scale where these things uh, are trying to, uh, to be measured. Now, what if we want it? So that, that's basically what I'll talk about uh, for neutrinos double beta again. Now, if we want to extend the PMNS matrix, we can actually search for potential heavy mass states by looking at energy momentum conservation with the electron neutrino. So if I look at the vertex here for the emission uh, of an electron neutrino, here's my electron neutrino, that is a superposition of the same decay, except for emitting neutrino one, neutrino two, neutrino three mass states, or plus four, five, six, et cetera. So that means that at some point you get a superposition of all of these different masses that are being emitted and you have to conserve energy and momentum. So again, I show up this other picture. Possible, we don't know why the neutrinos are as light as they are. 
We don't know how they get mass. So the, the coupling of the Higgs field that generates mass for the rest of the particles, mass of particles in the standard model, is not possible to generate the lightness of the mass scales that you see uh, for the neutrinos. And so one of the possible explanations is something called the seesaw mechanism, where for every left-handed light neutrino that you have, you have a correspondingly heavy right-handed neutrino. So this would, again, satisfy this condition of having a six-by-six six matrix uh, with Majorana fermion masses. Now, these we know are much less than an EV scale. And this, we only can really say that it has to be less than some grand unification scale, but it could be at the grand unification scale. So if we want to search for these, we also need to realize that they are sterile, or they're mostly sterile. Remember, as I said earlier on, neutrinos only have left-handed chiral interactions. They're the only particles in the standard, the only fermions in the standard model that have only a left-handed chiral nature. So perhaps the easiest thing to do is to say, well, neutrinos should actually have both left and right. It's just we don't see the right-handed ones because they don't interact with our standard model. And so in some level within that PMS matrix, you get a really minimal mixing between these two uh, sterile flavor states and the mass states that may allow us to be able to see this. But this is sort of a, this is called the minimal, uh, neutrino minimal standard model. So we use energy momentum conservation in nuclear beta decay, and I talked about this yesterday, but essentially what we do is we look at a nuclear electron capture, we're in the final state, we have a daughter atom and a neutrino. I can write down the kinetic energy of the daughter atom that I detect as a function of its neutrino mass, because there's only one way that you can share energy and momentum uh, in nuclear electron capture. And so the way we do this is with the beast data. So again, we have this PMNS matrix, we're searching for these heavy mass states that would generate something larger or, or we would carry away more uh, momentum in the system because the neutrino now would be heavier than it otherwise was for the light mass states. And so we would see that as a decrease in the kinetic energy of the lithium atom simply through energy and momentum conservation of the system. So some fraction of our events would basically show up as a shifted uh, spectrum. So we search for this as the whole spectrum being shifted to lower energies uh, from, from what we observed. So for those that weren't there yesterday, this is essentially the B spectrum in red here. Uh, and these are the kinetic energies of the nuclear recoils in electron volts. We measure these using these superconducting detectors that I had mentioned before. So currently from phase two of the data, we basically excluded this region at about an order of magnitude better than had been done in the past using a single pixel. And we're currently scaling the experiment up. So this is in the 100 to 850 keV mass range for neutrinos. But this is still not really uh, the interesting region where we would expect mixing to occur. We still have to go uh, much more sensitive. Now, we can do that with radioactive sources because you just include a lot more decays in there. As long as you understand your system at the level that you think you do, you can continue to put more and more radioisotopes into them uh, and make those measurements. The current landscape of heavy neutrino searches, at least on the electron side, looks something like this. So you can go all the way across from the EV scale to the TEV scale. And this is its coupling of that heavy neutrino, whatever mass it might be, to the electron flavor. So how many fraction of those electron neutrinos would you see uh, with this mass? And you can see that there's a whole mess of experiments that are sensitive to this. The beast experiment uh, is not on, this is an older plot from before we published our limits. Um, but basically the beast experiment is in here uh, and sort of looks somewhere here. So these limits come from cosmology. They're very powerful, but they have heavy model dependencies depending on if you assume that neutrinos are dark matter or where you look in the universe. These ones come from direct laboratory probes. So there's some model dependency, but they have vanishingly small cross sections. And this is the region where you see some of these anomalies uh, because they're very difficult measurements to make. And this region here where all of the isotopes are listed, these are the decay momentum reconstruction ones, uh, which are largely model independent because we're just doing energy momentum conservation beta decay. Uh, and in fact, with the BEAST experiment, we're actually going to extend this to include this region uh, where we get some overlap with cosmology. And we can do that because radioactive decay uh, can, can be made uh, to, to have high statistics. Now, in principle, you can also do the same thing both with uh, the mu and tau sectors as well. So there are also limits that come. Obviously, they're far more sparse because um, doing precision measurements with muon neutrinos and tau neutrinos are a lot more difficult because you can't produce some radioactive nuclear decays. Um, but you can also search for these things, uh, both using cosmology and uh, high energy colliders and, and things like that, where you can actually produce the energies to create um, uh, tau neutrinos, for example, or orbital neutrinos. So the last thing I'll say before one of my last slides is that 
basically what we're doing at the moment is we're trying to capitalize on the fact uh, that we have uh, included both the beast and sailor into the long range plans. We're trying to develop these new superconducting technologies so that we can really push the, uh, the measurements of these things to the limit where we're starting to test the standard model at an even more fundamental level. Uh, and in the neutrino sector, try to connect ourselves to cosmology as best we can. Uh, and in fact, we even, for the beast experiment uh, and the superconducting sensors, there was even a sidebar in there on, on these experiments in the long range plan. I can, the, the long range plan will banner is sitting up there. <laughs> okay, so the idea is that we really want to fully explore this entire nuclear chart with these superconducting sensors. So it started with the beast, but all of these other things that I've talked about, carbon 10, oxygen 14, uh, these systems that we want to study for nuclear beta decay, we can also study low energy transitions uh, for totally different things, nuclear clock transitions, uh, permanent electric dipole moments. Um, we can start searching for those, and, and in the end, that's what Sailor is going to do. And so just as an example of the types of beam rates that we think we can expect, uh, we can already do billions of, of these exotics. So this would be protactinium-229. We can produce a billion per second of those at f -rate. So we can do... Think of doing kind of high precision experiments uh, that are not limited by our choice of radio isotope. We can really go to the physical system that we want to study rather than just looking at the things that we have available to us. So, two matrices, the CKM matrix and the PMNS matrix. One is nearly diagonal, the other is heavily mixed. In the CKM matrix, the top row test leads the way, but it's currently three sigma below the unitarity condition, which implies physics beyond the standard model. This may, may still be. Uh, related to the uncertainties of the nuclear structure corrections, but that's been yet to be shown. Um, on the PMNS matrix side, the oscillation experiments can bring, constrain the elements well, and it's currently in agreement with unitarity, but there are anomalies related to this. These three plus N fits are one of them, right? Oscillation experiments fit better when you include more of the possibility of a non three by three paradigm in the PMNS matrix. And these Majorana physics may hint uh, at hidden neutrino physics, but we still don't know if the neutrino is actually a Majorana fermion yet. So with that, uh, I'm happy to take questions. One of the last points that you made, which is that um, action slide that um, oh. three point the three plus n fits uh, were better for looking at all the oscillation experiments together. Is that true account of the fact that adding degrees of freedom tends to make fits work better? No. Well? So it's, yes. So that that I mean that's a that's the point that I typically make all the time. I mean three plus one. I I mean somebody else probably looks better than I do, but three plus one I think fits. Quite a bit better, Dave. Do you know the answer to that? Uh, I, yeah, I mean it's a long story, but I think none of the three plus n fits fit with a reasonable test word. Yeah, yeah. So not, yeah, that's right. That's also true. Yeah. So it's a tricky. I mean, you're asking a good statistical question about things that don't agree with an error. So mm -hmm. there's lots of judgment involved in these fits, and you'll find lots of different analyses with different conclusions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but since since basically all of the elements in the PMNS matrix are exclusively determined from these oscillations. Uh, and, and the anomalies that we see in large part are due to the oscillation experiments. Um, yeah, the way that they do these fittings to extract that physics uh, is another thing that people need to look at. So you showed the graph of the CKM measurements, I think it's BUD for a bunch of different isotopes. Yep. Uh, I just wanted to ask, are they all the isotopes we know of with these uh, super loud transitions, where we can calculate BUD uh, well theoretically, or there are other isotopes as well that, for whatever reason, yeah, we haven't been able to measure so far. Um, so the most challenging one for us to measure is rubidium seventy four uh, because it's half life is seventy milliseconds or something like this. Um, but there are other challenges as well. So the one thing I didn't mention is that some of these have an, a total. <clears throat> have a, a Z projection of the isospin of zero, and some have a Z projection of, of one or minus one. Um, in principle, that doesn't make a difference, but in practice, it changes the decay fraction to the super allowed mode. So one of the challenges, the, the, the most, so I also didn't talk about this, but um, carbon 10, so if you now assume that, this assumes that there is no such thing as a scalar current. Um, this basically, so the CVC thing that I kind of briefly 
wiped over when I talked about uh, this. CVC, that's conserved vector currents. That means that, at least from the vector side, uh, it's V. There is no S, it's just V. So this is the assumption that's made when we extract this. We can also test this from the super loud system. It turns out that the sensitivity of potential scalar contributions to the vector part of the weak interaction go as one over uh, Z squared or Z cubed or something like this. And so at the very lightest cases, you actually see oxygen 14 and carbon 10, you actually see this inflection because they're the lightest ones. Um, and so if you measure carbon 10 to an order of magnitude better precision, you do something like two orders of magnitude better on your limits uh, for the scalar contributions to the weak interaction. So if you assume that CVC is, is a good conserved quantity, um, then these are the cases you study. If you want to do other things, then you can pick and choose different ones that have particularly interesting characters. And so for scalar limits, carbon 10 is the one you want to study. But the carbon 10 also has this other problem where the branching ratio is extremely hard to measure because the super allowed decay mode is to an excited state. And so you need to characterize the decay to the excited state by measuring a gamma ray and your understanding of the efficiency of your photon detector, you can't do at the absolute 0.01% level. So you need to find other ways. And one of the things we want to do with Sailor is basically measure the relative contributions uh, of the different shapes of the beta spectrum uh, or well, the recoil spectrum uh, to basically try to constrain that better. I just have a naive question. Yeah. How do you produce these rare isotopes? Yeah, that's a great question. No, no, that's not naive at all. So there's two different ways. I don't think I actually have any slides uh, related to that. Um, so there's two, two methods. At FRIB, there's something called uh, in-flight fragmentation. So you take a fast-moving, heavy primary beam, like uranium or something like this. You pass it through uh, a relatively thick uh, target relatively, um, and you fragment uh, the beam. So you, it's called projectile fragmentation. So you have a GeV energy beam that's fragmented through this target. And then all of the fragmented particles are flying forward with their momentum at GeV type energies. Uh, and using that particular method, you can push out to the sort of neutron rich side of the, the chart of the nuclei. So FRIB is a discovery machine. They're looking for new isotopes. Typically, for these experiments, we want high rate. That doesn't typically generate a high rate because you're limited by the beam intensity that you initially start with. And most of the experiments we do, we have to do with low energies anyway because we need precision and control. So we use the method that's done at CERN and at Triumph, which is called the isotope separation online technique, where you take uh, a high energy 500 MeV to 1 GeV proton beam and you smash that into a series of thin targets. You undergo spallation reactions, so you break the nuclei inside the target. Those then create every possible combination of protons and neutrons within the target. But now you need to worry about the target chemistry to diffuse out uh, those things you just created uh, in this hot environment out to a transfer tube. And then once you get that into the transfer tube, you can uh, use laser ionization to selectively ionize the neutral atoms that were created. And then you can accelerate them to wherever you need them to go. So those, there's, there's two main methods that we do this. Okay, there's no other option. Other, sorry, did I miss one? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if it's quick, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I guess it was in another like, question. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, which is uh, with the sailor, which is, is that right? That that's detecting the, um, the nuclear recoil? Yes, yeah. So you, I was curious just to hear a little more about how detecting nuclear recoil actually works. Like you mentioned yeah. super conducting sensors, but how do you identify what you're actually measuring and know something else? I'd be interested to know about that. Yeah, that's that's a great, great question. So it probably actually I can have a little backup slide too. Uh, so in essence, uh, basically what we have are we have these tunnel junctions. Um, and the way they work is I guess this is a picture of one of them. So you get these tiny, tiny pixels, we embed them directly into the pixel themselves. But what they are, they're SIS junctions. So you basically have a superconductor, some insulator, and then another superconductor below it. Um, when you embed them inside, uh, the low energy radiation breaks the Cooper pairs of the superconducting ground state in the superconductor. That generates charged particles, uh, which are these quasi particles or electrons, basically. 
you apply a very small voltage across the whole stack, which you can do because you've now introduced a tiny few nanometer tunnel barrier in between them that's aluminum oxide. Um, those charges flow across that barrier, they tunnel across that barrier. And on the other side, you read out a tunneling current, and that current was proportional to the amount of energy that you originally deposited. Um, so it works very similar to a semiconductor detector, except for the energy gap for superconductor is a thousand times smaller than that for a semiconductor. So you generate a thousand times more charge carriers per unit energy, uh, which gives you, you know, sensitive to very low energy radiation, but also uh, it gives you um, higher energy resolution at these low energies. And so for us, uh, you know, when you have a decay, the nuclear recoil has tens of EV of energy. It basically travels one atomic unit, but it breaks a number of these Cooper pairs. Uh, and then we basically read that out. Thank you. And incidentally, that's a Yale technology. Denver it is a Yale technology. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It was originally, this type of concept was originally proposed by Rudy Musbauer in Munich in the 80s. So, 